You are listening to Off Track with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lysett. Hello and welcome to the latest Off Track podcast uh, with me, Cornelius Lysett, and Martin Dwyer, and a special guest this week, uh, a legend of Everton Football Club and indeed big horse racing fan as well. It's the one and only Ian Snowden. How are you? Good morning. I'm great, thank you. Yeah. And you too? Yeah. All good. Yeah. I can't believe you've turned up with notes. Uh, well, I did a bit of planning last... Well, it was two nights ago, actually, so I thought I'll have some notes ready, so... You're on the ball. You're going to put us to shame. We just wing it, don't we? Well, I usually wing it. No one I've heard I might, might be getting caught out here, so I thought I'll have a few notes there. And I should just say, this, this podcast is being recorded in the city of uh, Liverpool, uh, and actually, we're at Aintree Racecourse, uh, which is somewhere you've you've ridden round. I have, yeah. Not, I have to say, over Beaches Brook and round the Canal Turn. No, it definitely wasn't. I rode in the Even bumper. though you tried to make out at one stage, you did. No, I did. The, the bumper went round the Canal Turn. Oh, yeah, I nearly <laughs> went the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, no, I rode in the bumper. I, I loved that. I wanted to ride on my, my uh, local track, which, you know, I mean, I was born. You can see, see the hospital over there, but I was born. Is that for Zachary Hospital? Zachary Hospital. So it was great to ride in. I mean, Aintree, what a special place. Incredible. Isn't it? I mean, even today when it's empty, it's just like we were saying when we stood on the balcony. It's just, a, it's just an amazing place. And the heritage of, of racing uh, is very much part of its appeal, I think. And the heritage of this place and all those Grand Nationals going back to lottery in 18... What do you reckon? 37? Before my time, mate. Yeah. yeah. Be... <laughs> no, I don't know about that. <laughs> don't upset no, the guests before we even start. It was 1837, yeah. Lottery won the first Grand National. But the heritage of this place, whether it's Lottery, whether it's Red Rum, whether it's Alden Meaty, whether it's Jenny Pittman, whether it's Bomb Scares or mm. Void Grand Nationals, it's it's part of the whole fabric of the thing, isn't it? Yeah, there's always plenty of trouble. I mean, when the, the national meetings on, the city kind of stops and braces it. I mean... You must have come to the National many times, Snods, did you? Absolutely, uh, especially when we got an home game as well. Um, you used to kick off early, and then if you got a good result, you couldn't wait to... I can see you smiling as you tell the story. <laughs> well, we, we didn't get beat early doors in them, them many times, so uh, it used to be... It used to take you about, what, half an hour, 45 minutes to get showered and get changed. But if you'd won the game the morning of the Grand National... You were ready in ten minutes. It was like <laughs> taxis down at Straight down, down yeah. the Grand National. And there was no sky in those days. No, to hold you up with it interviews was, and It things. was absolutely. So you'd literally taxis. finish at Goodison and just leg it straight down no, there. Taxis would be ordered, and you'd be you'd be down here easily for for first or second race. And uh, yeah, was you, you get mobbed? Though? Was you get mobbed by the fans? Sure. Yeah, yeah, but it's part of it, isn't it? You, Even yeah. more than usually. You, you, yeah, you're in a racing environment. You, you know where you're going. You, you've had a great result. Fans are, are buzzing. Fans are here having a great time watching the Grand National. So you expect it. So get on with it. It's, uh, it's great. It's part of it. And don't get me wrong. Any sportsman, I don't care who you are, likes the ad- adulation. Yeah, you course, do. Yeah. You've won a game of football. You know, people coming up, putting your arm around you, and great result, and can I buy you a drink? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, you'd be false if you didn't say you like that. Well, there's of course, a few false ones around then, because there are there people is. who. Well, do. I know there is in today's football, but I think in. And today's in, sport. Yeah, yeah, in today's sport. Mm. But in our time, I think you used to love it. Mm. I did. I did personally. Yeah, I why think. not? It's far yeah. off, isn't it? Yeah, you'd, you'd give your all on, on the football field, you'd won the result, there'd be 40,000 in Goodison cheering you on, and then you'd come here and there'd be. Thousands and thousands here, and you get the same here. So, and if news is coming through that Liverpool were getting beaten, oh, even better, <laughs> even better. <laughs> and what about you? You came, did you tell me that because you said you were born in that hospital, so you yeah. grew up a mile away, barely that exactly. Yeah, and then we moved a bit further out, we moved out towards Wiston Way. So, did you used to come and run around the track as a kid? I remember I came once, we, got, we used to, you know, when we were building the fences, we used to come up and climb on up the Mellon Road yeah. up the fence. And then we try and run round as we built, and then they chase us in the little golf. Can I ask you, what did you weigh as a baby? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. That's a weird, hey, that's a weird no, question. It is, it is because jockeys are weird questions go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're dead light. Were you, you tiny, were you tiny as a baby? I was going to say. So, no, I were you tiny as a, as a. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. As a kid, I, looked, I was like. Um, I used to be able to climb through me. You've got to ask your mum. You've got to ask your mum uh, um, what you weighed as a baby. Because I'll ring her on the way home. I, I, was, I was ten pounds. I'll say Ian Snowden and wants to know. I was never going to be a, a jockey at ten pound even at birth. I used to. I got my head stuck in the railings in Sparrow Hall in Bazakley. 
I got my head stuck in the railings <laughs> and uh, the fire. <laughs> my nan came out and she got the chip. Remember everyone had a chip pan? Yeah. And she got the lord of the chip pan and she put it round my head <laughs> and my neck. And they were trying to pull me out the railings and I couldn't because I tried to get through such a small gap. And um, in the end, you have to get the fire brigade out to <laughs> cut the bars. <laughs> that was just across the way. Yeah. yeah. So what, I'm, I'm thinking of golf buggies chasing you around the track, though. Yeah, when they were building the fences, so a few days before the national. So we'd come up and then we'd run round and jump over the fences like, like a gang of lads and then they'd chase you. But if they caught you back then, it'd give you a bit of a hide. <laughs> but that was part of it. Yeah. You can't do that now, can you? Well, do you ever get caught? Um, I think I caught once and then I just I pretended to cry and they let me go. <laughs> 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 but we, yeah, we used to, and I used to, we used to play football on the Saturday morning and watch the helicopters come over. And I remember saying to the lads, I'll be, I'm going to be in an helicopter one day. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, you know. I hope Hollywood scriptwriters are listening. <laughs> all the way from watching the helicopters yeah, to... Yeah, but I used that, I was like, look, that's all the rich people going to uh, mm. Aintree, what's the national? And that was just fields over there. Great memories. Mm. That, I, I'll tell you what, I was thinking the story you told me the other day, talking of your youth and horses, mm. going to the holiday camp in North Wales. And oh, getting, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, just that tell us so that that, so that we bears. Went, re, you have told it quite a lot of times, but it bears retelling. Yeah, so we went on holiday to Prestavon Stands. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, staying in a caravan, and there was horses grazing on the other side of the big stone wall. So I bet all the kids there all put in twenty p each, and I'm like betting twenty p each that I'd jump on the back of one of the horses. So I think we got about one pound forty. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly died. <laughs> threw myself off the stone wall, landed on the, the arse of this horse, slipped down and it kicked me back over the wall. So I'm led on the floor, having an asphalt sack with a big horseshoe wow. bruised across my chest and uh, all the kids ran off, didn't pay me, <laughs> <Didn't> <laughs> or <laughs> died. Yeah. Literally tried to jump on the back of the horse. Wow. Did you ever, have you ever ridden, a, no. your kids are yeah, my, ponies, aren't they? I, um, my oldest daughter now, she's 35, Zoe, and on a two-year-old birthday at Christmas, sorry, she was two, and we bought her a pony. Uh, lived out in, in Doncaster at the time, uh, out in the uh, out in the sticks, and we bought her a pony. And then my all my girls, my, my, my wife have had horses. The boys have not been interested. They were interested in, like, the little motorbikes or, or football, just mm. football, football. But the girls, yeah, horses. So we bought, I've always had horses around me, but I'm scared of them. I'm seriously scared of it. I, I don't feed them. I don't stroke. I'm kind of reluctant. I wish I, I wish I didn't like them because I'd be a wealthy fellow if I didn't <laughs> like them. By the way, but um, no, they just, they just, they're beautiful creatures. They're beautiful animals. But I'm, there's just something about them. I think they're going to bite me, or they don't like me. I can't, and I'm kind of reluctant. But don't get me wrong. I think they are marvelous creatures. I love them. So what first got you into racing? Interested. So. Uh, my old fellow was a miner in Yorkshire, um, in Rotherham in South Yorkshire, and he used to love a bet on a Saturday afternoon. And to be fair, I'd play a school game, uh, football in the morning, Saturday morning for your school, which I don't think they even do these days. No. Uh, I think that all that's being lost. And then I used to come home and then have a bit of dinner, and then my dad used to walk up, put his bets on, and then come back, and he used to put racing on. And being 10 and 11, I used to think, oh, God, <laughs> can't watch this. 97 or something, was it? Yeah, I, I can't watch this for two hours. So I just used to get, gather all my mates and we used to go playing football. But then the more I started watching it and I saw my dad getting carried away or disillusioned, whatever his <laughs> bet were, I thought, I kind of like this. And probably from 16 onwards, I'd had my first bet when I was 16. Did it win? Two pound double, 14 to 1 and 10 to 1. I won over five hundred pound, and I was on twenty six pound a week at Doncaster. And what were you sixteen? I was sick. I shouldn't have had a bet, but there were two of us who used to go in an afternoon after training, and we used to go. Well, he looked about eighteen. My pal who was apprentice with me, so he I put looked the bet about on. twelve. Yeah. So he put the bet on, <laughs> and I had two pound each way, and it won. I won over five hundred pound, and I was on twenty six pound a week as an apprentice. So imagine that, £26 yeah. pound to £500. Pound. It's like a, a year's wage, nearly three months wage. You're Las Vegas. And I just got the bug. Mm. And now I'm skinny. No, I, ain't got a, I ain't got a penny. You've never owned a horse. Have you owned horses? Oh, I've got, a, I've got a 
of thing in your nose. I've in my nose oh, no, that no. I wrote that. We leased and I've never owned one, but we leased one. Right. It's so funny. I signed for Everton and it was Kevin Ratcliffe's testimonial year. And uh, so they knew I were into horse racing, so we, we had a bit of a do. I can't remember where it was, somewhere in Liverpool, and Kev Ratcliffe went to me, Snod, you're into your horse racing, aren't you? I went, yeah, yeah, why? He said, got a top trainer here. And I'm thinking, wow, Henry Cecil, <laughs> Barry Hills, uh, Mr. Earn. I'm just thinking, who can it be, Luca Kamani? So I went, who is it, Kev? He went, Mike O'Neill from Lydia. <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, Mike O'Neill? I said, I've never heard of him. He went, come on, I'll introduce you to him. And I'm thinking, Mike O'Neill from Lydia. I thought I was meeting Henry Cecil or something like that. Anyway, Mark, I shook his hand, and I was sober at the time, so I shook his hand. <laughs> Three hours later, I'm blind drunk. I'm sat on a settee with Mike O'Neill. He's got his arm round me, and he's offered me a taxi lift home with him. And you've got a horse with him. He's got me to lease this horse and get all what the What was it called? Dan the Man. Dan the Man. So I, I worked for Mike. Dan the Man. Before I left. Jimmy, Jimmy Fortune was his apprentice yeah. at the yeah. time. And he rode him a good winner, did he? Win he looked, oh, oh, well, 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 I've got that wrote down well, as well, by the way. He gave me another two job worth 50 to 1. Yeah. 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 That's another story. And how much you have on him? Nothing, because he told me not to back it. He said he didn't fancy it. <laughs> I walked into the bookies. We're going in training. I walked into the bookies. I said to Kev Sheedy, who was driving at the time, we all used to take it in turns. I said, uh, Kev, stop here at the bookies. I want to see what's won the air gold cup. I backed another horse. And as I walked in, they're putting the blanket, the rug, air gold cup winner, on Joveworth. No. And I'm looking, it was, and I'll never forget, it, it was heavy going that day. Unbelievable. And I'm looking. And I couldn't, I couldn't speak, I'm just looking there. And I walked out and I just walk into the car and they're going, what won it? And I'm going, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> shaking my head. Ask. And Don't Kev ask. went, not Joveworth. And I went, I'm not going to swear on you, but I did swear, I went, Joveworth, 50 to 1. So all them bust out laughing, but yeah, he won the and, and what about Dan the Man, how did he do? What he never run. <laughs> so you <laughs> leased a horse that never run. Oh. And your trainer had a 50 to 1 winner. Yeah. That was a good start. A great start. <laughs> Um, yeah, he taught me into leasing this horse. So I taught Kev Ratcliffe, Dave Watson, Neil Point, who didn't have a clue about horses anyway, Ian Wilson. Dave, I wouldn't want to tell Dave Watson that your horse is no good. Oh, How did it? I mean, it's even better. So uh, anyway, this horse. Man. So I, li I lived at Burtdale, so I used to come that way. So Mike and Neil, Lydia. So I said, Mike, every two days a week, can I call in? Can I have a cup of tea with you? Can I see the horse? Yeah, no problem, Ian. So Dave Watson pulled me in training one day and he said, Snod, is there any chance of this afternoon after training going down and seeing Dan? And all the talk were about Dan, even Colin Harvey, who was the manager then, you said, How's Dan this morning, Snod? As we warming up, we're stretching off. And, and Sharpie had no interest. He lived with and travelled in Cabby, had no interest in his going. Carl, don't ask him about Dan, it's hopeless. So all the lads are, Yeah, he's all right, Carl. He's, yeah, he's ready, he's ready for a run and stuff like this. And Dave Watson said to me, He said, uh, can you ring Mike and see if I can nip down and see Dan this afternoon after it? And I went, yeah, no problem. So I rings Mike and Neil. I said, Mike, is it all right if Big Waggy, Big Dave Watson comes down and sees the horse? He went, yeah, no problem. He had about 13 training at the time, 25. And Waggy said, shook hands with Mike and Neil. He said, they're walking down the stables. He said, and every one of them kicking the stable doors. He said, their head's <laughs> bouncing out of the stables. He said, and here we are, Dave, here's Dan. He said he was fast asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he said he was just laying down like that. He said, Fuck you know. He said, a war, he said, one horse out of all the stable fast asleep and it would damn the man. So then he wasn't happy when he got back. Oh, he, he hammered me. But <laughs> Kev Sheedy with the treasurer. He had to collect all the money and the lads got that fed up because he needed a needle, he needed a gun at dentist. Yeah, never run. And we were just paying and paying. And uh, eventually the lads just started pulling out and left it all to him. He didn't get a bar from Weatherby's for three years for not <laughs> for, she did. for not being yeah, for not paying the bills. All us were all right because he was the main she, man. You threw him under the bus. We threw him massively. But he's had a decent horse the last couple of years. Jabberocky, yeah, he yeah, has. One of you, wasn't he? You know, he was that? Trained by Eric Helston. Right. Yeah, Jabberocky. He had a he had a decent uh, he's done quite two well. three year old it were at the time and yeah I think he trained it with Paul Green at Lydia who yeah, was Mike and he had stables at the time. And, uh, and then he moved it to 
Very awesome. But uh, yeah, they've had a couple of good wins with it. Yeah, it's, so the events, Weatherby's eventually that after let twenty him, years, let him back in. Back yeah, let him fold. back in. But that uh, used to be massive when people used to appear before the committee, and they used to ha it used to be convened in some very posh. It might have even been the Cafe Royal or something somewhere in the middle of London. Oh, was that? And you used to have to the go Texas, and appear it? before. Or, or if you didn't, then you obviously had no chance. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and you were barred. They could have big powers to do it. And was I, that I don't, pretentious, was it? Just oh, it was, well, I'm not sure it was pretentious. I think it was just frightening. Right. Rather. And they used to, you know, if you hadn't paid, then it was called the Fourth Fit Committee, I think it was called. And you were, you, you, you were not allowed on the race course. Oh, it really stressed well, these yeah. and all the lads didn't care. Talking about posh, and obviously mm. racing is quite a, a posh sport. How impressed with me are you that I've converted an old Etonian <laughs> into an Evertonian? <laughs> I mean, that's some doing, isn't it? It yeah. is, but there's only one club. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah. There is. yeah, we can all agree on that, can't we? We can, we can agree. Funny enough, I nearly had a bit of a wardrobe problem this morning. I had a red jumper to put on. Oh, and I thought, oh, yeah. I, 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 I can't be. I want to so, do the interview. If, I, if you had ever had a red jumper on, I want to do the interview. But and are there certain pubs in the? I remember going to a pub in Liverpool, right in the centre of um, right Paradise Street, uh, mm. right in the centre. It's called the Catherine Wheel, and I think I was told it was a Liverpool pub as opposed to an Everton pub. And I went out one night during uh, the Grand National meeting with Charlie Brooks, uh, racehorse trainer at that point and very much on the up, and uh, now a, a writer, um, and John Inverdale, uh, oh. broadcaster. So we went in there. And we, we set off from the, um, no, it wasn't the Adelphi, the Atlantic Tower Hotel in the city. And um, John and I were waiting in reception for Charlie Brooks, who appeared in this, not just a red jumper, but a, but a bright, no, it must have been an Everton pup, so it was a bright red jumper. And we said, do you, do you think, Charlie, do you think that's a good idea to be going around <laughs> Liverpool in that bright red? You know, you'll have some friends, but you'll have some people who might hear you going, oh, well, well, we'll go down here. <laughs> and might, might sort of take against you. Oh, I'll be absolutely fine, he well, said. With his so, accent and the red jumper, they'd have just mistaken him for a tourist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, so we went into this pub and there were, it was, even during the Grand National meeting, it was completely empty bar... Three ladies on what it was. I think it might have been ladies, uh, ladies' day at Aintree. It was that night. So there were only three people in the whole pub. There were three ladies all on the same pub, uh, the same table. So we thought we, you know, they're probably feeling a bit lonely. We're feeling a little bit lonely. So we go over and say hi. And he says, one way to put it. <laughs> and he says, so Brooke says, uh, ladies, can we, uh, can can we join you? And they said, yeah, yeah, join, yeah, of course you can, of course you can. So he said, ladies, may I introduce my, my party? Uh, this, he said, is pointing at John Inverdale. And he called him Jake. He said, this is Jake. <laughs> and Jake's a uh, professional punter. And uh, ladies, he's had a terrible, terrible day. So be nice to him, be nice to him. So they go, oh, you're a professional punter. Oh, well, we'll be nice to you. You've lost your money. They're very, quite impressed with this, not recognising Inverdale. Uh, then he turned to me and he said, and this is, what did he call me? I think he called me... Uh, he, fun enough, he called me Terry, I think. Um, uh, and that's only amusing because the producer of this podcast is uh, called Terry. Tight ship Terry to us because he runs a tight ship. Anyway, so this is Terry. And uh, he's quite dull, he says, pointing to me. From, he says, he's an accountant from Surrey. But he's a professional punter as well, and he can't stop having winners. So they were quite impressed with that. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, well, give us some winners for tomorrow. And then he looked, sat back in his chair, and he at the time, Charlie, was a big racehorse trainer. He was yeah. training a lot yeah, of winners. Of he'd won at Hennessy. I think he'd won lots. He leapt back in his chair, and he said, And ladies, my name is Charlie. I'm a racehorse trainer from Lambourne. And they turned and said, Ah, oh, shut up. Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he'd have killed him, wouldn't he? Oh, he didn't like that. He, he, no. he maintains in his book that I have made that story up. <laughs> but he still told the story in the book. You do make stories up, but I'll believe well, that. Well, yeah, I'm a journalist. Well, that's I think it's polishing a story. He's famous. To be fair, Cornelius, there is more Liverpool pubs in Liverpool because Liverpool fans go in to watch the games in pubs. Right. Our fans go to the game. That's a true point. So that's, that's why there's more that's Liverpool true. pubs than ever. Right, yes. right. That was a great picture the other day. Um, I, I know we're, this is a racing podcast rather than a football one, but I love that photograph when Liverpool were being, uh, they were being beaten, weren't they, the other day? Yeah. Um, they were, were they eventually beaten? Yeah, they were. By, they well, they've been beaten a couple beat. of times this season. <laughs> to but, yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> all the, but all the Everton fans were going, I just love that photograph that was around on social media. All the Everton fans 
uh, going to Goodison and the game was still on, the Liverpool game, they're getting beaten. And just the big crowds, somebody left their somebody window and the curtains open, open and they were all <laughs> following it on the telly. Yeah, and the Arsenal game, was Watching it? them get yeah. beat. Yeah. Oh. They were getting beat this yeah. time. Unfortunately, yeah. um, but, but they, they had the last laugh. Yeah, or, which we got beat as well, didn't we? Yeah, but anyway. But you famously... You had the choice of playing for Evan or Liverpool when you signed for Evan, 87? 87. Yeah, 87. And you decided, you seen the light of God. You I did seen... see the light of God, yeah. Um, wow, what a tough decision. I, I was at Leeds United then. I was quite happy at Leeds United. I'd got a, a manager who had managed me at Doncaster as a 16-year-old kid, Billy Bremner, who, well, you need no explanation um, who Billy Bremner were uh, at the time, one of the best footballers Leeds and Scotland have, have ever had and uh, for him to be my manager at Doncaster he gave me my debut at 16 he made me captain at Doncaster was he as angry as he looked? yeah, he was. yeah. <laughs> yeah. no messing no, about no messing about didn't yeah. have to think about that <laughs> no <laughs> no he, yeah. he was he yeah. was but um, if you did the business for him mine nicest man you'll ever ever meet in your life if you weren't prepared to work and you weren't then he, he wouldn't entertain you and mm. rightly so uh, but he made me captain at Doncaster when I were 18 uh, which was a huge honour at 18 year old. I got a brother, Glenn, who's three years older than me. We were in the same team. So I'm captaining him, and he's three years older than me, but I'm captaining men that's 28, 29, 30, a lot more experience. And how did they cope with that? I didn't think. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really. Because if you're a racehorse trainer, I told, and you've got an 18 year old who's, who's absolutely sensational, and you've got older jockeys, and you know, this around the weighing room will have happened to you. Go on, look, there's I, a lot of resentment. I absolutely 100% know where you're coming from, but I just took it upon myself. He's men my captain. I were quite vocal, even as a young no. kid. <laughs> I, could, I could handle myself on a football field, and I think I got a lot of respect from the older players. There might have been one or two players who weren't actually getting in the team at the time were a bit disillusioned with the manager and must have thought, oh, he's a, he's a pet and stuff mm. like that. But, but if you're good enough, the same in our, in our sport. If you're, we see young... I remember when I was I was riding for Andrew Baldwin, I was stable jockey, and I seen a kid coming through and I thought, my job's gone, I need mm. a year or two. And that was William Buick. Yeah. I just knew. It, it must be the same Yeah, it is, it is. It's like you only mentioned Wayne Rooney. Uh, yeah. Mm. 14 year old, he was the best eight playing in the under 18s. He was the best player by far. By 16, he's in the first team. Yeah. There was no resentment from the first team players because they knew how good this boy was. And he could improve them as a team. I, I, I think I remember uh, talking of Buick. I remember being at Ascot one day when he was still probably, if not claiming seven, he was still an apprentice. And I was talking to your mate Jamie Spencer. Mm. And he came past, and Spencer didn't know him at the time. And I remember him saying to me, "He'll be all right because he doesn't try and he doesn't try and sort of be uh, Charlie Big Potato or whatever. You know, he does yeah, want yeah. to be. Uh, you know, he wants to to fit in and to learn a bit as well and to just come along quietly. And um, yeah. and actually, the Buick. You know, talking of Buick for a second, I think it's my favourite story. So I'm changing the su changing the su uh, subject a tiny bit. My favourite story in the lead up to Champions Day, Kipco British Champions Day at Ascot, is the fact that William Buick was there at King's Clear all those years ago, and Ian Balding, Andrew Balding's father, backed him. It was only a verbal bet, I read, but a verbal bet that he will one day be champion jockey at a big price to win five grand. Uh, and he had this verbal bet with the head of the tote way back when, and technically the bets run out. But, and he's champion jockey this year, and the tote had come forward and said, you know, here's the five Yeah, it was before he was 30, wasn't it? It was, I think, so he's yeah. now, what, 30, is he now, what, 31 or two? Yeah, he's that just old, so But the tote have said, here's five grand, and Ian's going to give it to the injured jockeys fund. And I just thought that was really, what, what, that Kingsclear Academy, which you were very much part of, which William was part of, David Prober, Oshie Murphy, and, and lots of other riders mm -hmm. over the years, it, it, there was a real family uh, feel, and that he just will be Ian absolutely glowing with pride. Williams won that uh, champion yeah. jockey's title Come by an absolute yeah. mile. Yeah, yeah. King's it, Clare's, it's like the Everton Academy, like the right. School of Science. Okay. Can I can I ask a question? How is the b big difference between the likes of yourself, who's won a derby, to likes of Buick, Frankie Di Tori? Why? I can't understand that. I can understand it in football, Ronaldo's, your Messi's, they're gifted. But in horse racing, a jockey, I can't understand that. Is, is there a gap? It's a good question because, the, let's be honest, and I think there was an interview done, a survey, or a lot of jockeys were interviewed, and they all said the same. 
the horse does 95% yeah. of the work. So, but there are some jockeys, I'll be honest, who are not that good, but they're doing really well because they're either related to the trainer or oh. they've just got lucky. But in general, you know in any sport, Frankie the Tory, when I'm in a race with him, he does things and you go, Ryan Moore, I'll be like, I'll have him boxed in and he'll be in eighth position. I've got him and then I've, I've got the race won and he comes and gets me and you go, how did he get to that position? Wow. How's he? The Tory, the gate's open, 20 runners, he's in the perfect position. Mick Canan, when he won New yeah. York yeah. on uh, See the Stars, it's yeah. like ice running through his veins. They make less mistakes. So a jockey can get a horse beat. Yeah, and, and not, not only do they make less mistakes, that other five percent, which has to be persuade that they have to be persuaded to do. A. P. McCoy used to persuade yeah. horses yeah. to do things that they didn't know they could do, mm -hmm. and then they suddenly thought because he he could then make a horse, couldn't he? Because yeah. suddenly they thought, oh, that wasn't that wasn't too bad, mm -hmm. and uh, and and on they went from there. He was an, he's an extreme McCoy, wasn't he? Yeah, he yeah, but Tatori McCoy, yeah. Um, yeah. Ryan Moore, Ruby Walsh, these type of guys. And they, no, I'm in that well, yeah. Funny enough, I. Be nice. Yeah, you are in that category <laughs> on your day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do you know I was rewatching? Oh, I think we've 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 talked about this in previous podcasts. But uh, rewatching Persian Punch the other day, and I have to say, per Persian Punch winning at Goodwood, you were quite good. That was I was fit then. I was only yeah. twenty odd. There was a lot. Do you notice that your greatest horses, Persian Punch, Sir Percy, and Pile Driver, all all begin beginning or nearly beginning with P. Yeah. So uh, maybe that's uh, that's some kind of way Just of... Just ride horses with a P. In <laughs> <laughs> Talking of P, you met Lester Piggott when you were young. I did, that I was, did. That was on your bucket list, wasn't it? It was. I was, I was 18 and uh, during close season, I went down, we, I had a pal in uh, Rotherham, uh, Noel Weaver, these were, his brother used to be a stable lad for Henry Cecil. All right. So he said, do you fancy three, three days down in Newmarket? And really, I weren't an heavy drinker at the time. Mm. And the old fellow were a bit strict as well. Even though I were 18 year old and I were playing football and I were captain of Donny, he were like, because oh, they were all like a lot older than me, these boys. Call, my dad would call him, come on, Colin, let's let's take him down, let's educate him. And he's going, he's got a career. Is this a... Anyway, he eventually let me go. So I had three days down in Newmarket. And the uh, best three days. Oh, we went on the gallops every morning before the races and seeing the horses coming from here, there and everywhere. And, and then <clears throat> I had my picture took with Ardross. Uh, can't believe I've not got this picture to this day. I had it up to 10 years ago and I were at the stables and Ardross was an unbelievable horse. I had my picture took with that and then Lester Piggott was stood at the top of the uh, the gallops one morning. On I the thought, and On the heath. And I thought, I need a picture. I need a picture, and I just. Have you I still just, got that picture? No, no, and I've not got that. And I, I went up, and I'm thinking he's just going to bin me off here. <laughs> uh, he's a ledge. Yeah. He was Sir Leicester in our household. My yeah. dad idolised him. He idolised Jeffrey Boycott at cricket, but Leicester Piggott on the. And you got your fifth. Did he charge you for it? He didn't actually. <laughs> I don't think you were too happy, like. Yeah, he, 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 he didn't smile. <laughs> yeah, he didn't smile, but yeah, I got the picture took with him. So. Ardross and Leicester Piggott in them three days, it don't come any better than that. I mean, Newmarket is something Incredible. else, isn't it? If you've never been, Incredible. Just, it, is, it is a... You can't really believe with Newmarket that, 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 that it works as well as it does. Mm. I, I, I always imagine that there must be uh, some kind of person with a clipboard there saying, right, William Haggis, you can come in at 8 o'clock, yeah. William Jarvis next, and Mark Prescott next. But but they don't. But I suppose everyone knows when everyone else mm. roughly is going to be yeah. there. I think they all, they all try and outdo each other. Remember Clive Britton? Yeah, yeah. He, he used to pull his string out like 4 o'clock in the morning to get on the gallops first. The earliest so you could. Going work. So, yeah, so, so the, he so had to be persuaded in the end that four o'clock in the morning in the middle of winter wasn't a great idea <laughs> when it was dark. Because I think he used to go out when it was dark. He literally he? would yeah. pull out. I remember, I, I remember the Tory had to gallop horse for him one day and he, he said to me, <laughs> he came up the high street still dark and there were people coming out the nightclub. And he's going, he's trying, because he's watching people coming out the nightclub and he's going to meet Clive. Is Lambourne the same? Or not on a lesser scale? Not on a, on a, on a smaller scale. Right, and, okay. and, and also the, the uh, stables tend to have um, a less public access, don't they, to the, yeah. to, to right, the gallops. Yeah. So but you yeah. don't see them all going up and around the, hit, around the road so much. Yeah, it's, it's just on a smaller Is Newmarket the only place where the traffic lights have got special lights oh, for, yeah, for horses got, to cross? Right, yeah. Yeah. So you can, I've never, I've, I've, I don't try it because I'd probably fall off as normal. <laughs> but you, if you get your, if you can reach, you put the presser thing and it, 
you know, stops the lights where you can cross. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it is, it's a, oh, it's it's a mad place. place. I want to ask you, so we talk about, in sports, I think we've losing a lot of characters. Mm. I think the game has been a bit, di- I don't, people, I maybe it's just the modern era, people got to be careful what they say, players, sportsmen. I put it all and down. And it's your age as well, uh, 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 as you oh, get yeah, older. Yeah. Totally, but I put it down to social media. Are you telling me that a lot of players wouldn't love to go for a beer after a game, after a good result? Yeah, and they couldn't do it. And they can't do it because... Not even a shandy. And, no, yeah. because you're in a public place after a game. They'd love to, I have no doubt. And all they do is have a chat with the teammates, have a chat with the opposition after the game, get in the car and go home. It's yeah. safest place for them. And I think that is so sad. And... It's the mobile phones. So, so, the, so the characters are still there, but they're yeah. just not allowed to express yeah. themselves. I get incredibly well with Jordan Pickford when I go up to the training ground. He's full of life. He's bubbly character. He loves his racing, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. And you've seen him at darts uh, competitions mm. at, the, at the tournaments there. And Jordan, I'd, I'd love to have a little beer. And so, th- loads of players would from not just from Evan, from from every yeah. Premier League club. And the less the, the lower you go. Lads will still go and have a drink. The second division teams in the Ferg, who are not as well known, but the Premier League players, they're, they're in this little goldfish bowl that they can't get out of. And, and people, is, do you know what Colin is? People have got, oh, they're on hundreds of thousands of pounds, they're on this, but you've got to have some kind of life as well, aren't you? Yeah. Outside and to perform, football. I think you need a bit of a release mechanism you do. to perform. I mean, Howard encouraged it, didn't he? To <laughs> a point. Do you know what? Howard were brilliant. He, if we got beat, which weren't very often in the first couple of years I was yeah. there, um, if we if we got beat, he just used to look forward to the next game. That's gone. Yeah. We can't do anything about that now. It's gone. Let's have a nice drink on bus together. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a laugh and let's get ready on Monday to go again. And and that's how it is. But it, it's tough now. I, I've in a way I feel sorry for the modern day footballer, but I don't because the money they're earning is extortionate for the for the. So it's a trade-off kind of thing. Yeah. So you get more money, a lot more, but yeah, it the is. pressure. But the pressure of the run. It's a bit the same in racing, isn't it? I think um, a lot of jockeys got to be really careful what they do yeah. now and everything's so well, me. Uh, absolutely. And do you remember before Sunday racing started, Sunday racing started in the mm. 1990s, uh, Saturday night was a was a big night out. Mm. Right? So, so probably a lot of people had been to the big meeting, Ascot, Newbury, York, Haydock, wherever it was. And then, you know, descended back on certain pubs, certain hotels, certain restaurants to have a really good night, to let their hair down. But now there's Sunday racing, which has been there. So there's practically no opportunity. I always think that the British Horse Racing Authority or the authority, not, not, I won't just blame the authority, but the authorities have never been as sympathetic or as sensitive as they might have been to the fact that this weekend could be a flat racing weekend and that weekend could be a jump racing weekend mm, yeah. and that will give more opportunities. To, but um, to celebrate. Yeah. Right, I want to talk about this, right? This fella, our mate beside us, yeah. he won't have a clue what that is. Right. right? The Liverpool Pink Echo. Yeah. He will not. Have you ever heard of this? I, of course I have. <laughs> Was it, is there an Atonian Echo? <laughs> there wasn't, no, no, there, well, wasn't, I, there wasn't one. But there was an uh, amazing how Etonian and Evertonian sort of they, they, they merge into one. That's yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. I used to, so this paper I, for people that might be listening to this that are under a certain age, this was printed on a Saturday afternoon mm-hmm. after the football results, but and it was just all. I used to deliver this. Did you not? Yeah. So I brought Which this. Year from, is this? This is from Saturday, May the seventh, nineteen ninety four, and this was a game I remember well because it's when Everton stayed up. And your big mate, Snods, scored two goals. I know you don't like talking about I it. I don't like talking about it. He gets all the publicity out of it. He, but you he played in this game. You, I watched it on YouTube. So there were ten others You didn't, played. You didn't tuck your shirt in, though. Well, he, can I tell you, he thinks he's the only player that played on that day. So who are you talking about? <laughs> Graeme Stewart. Graeme right. Stewart. He scored two goals. Barry Horn scored a belter. We needed to win to stay up yeah. last game of the season against the crazy gang. Yeah. I mean, I, I did watch it on YouTube, and you, you did play well. I mean, playing against them. Yeah, it, it was tough. What it was, Cornelius, see, I think the bigger escape were Crystal Palace for me. But people will say... This year. Yeah, yes. because we were 2-0 down at half-time. Yeah. We'd not most even, of us the telly. We'd not even had a shot. So what was worse, playing in that game or watching? Watching. Really? By an absolute country. You could, you could do something to affect that result when you were playing. 
me and Darren Griffiths commentating, we couldn't do anything. We were just com well, he was commentating on his own. I, I thought you won an award for your commentary. I know. I, mean, I couldn't even get any words out. I swear <laughs> that the last four games of the last season, I couldn't get any words out. But that particular game against Crystal Palace, I was just like a fan and I was just praying for us to win. And I just, we do bless him. He was doing all the commentary himself. <laughs> I felt sorry for him, to be honest. But um, but no, that in that game, we were actually on the pitch and you could do something or try and do something mm. to get you back in when, when you're just commentating you can't but I think we was this team were 2-0 down at half time never looked like scoring yeah. first half and I'm thinking wow we've got to go to Arsenal last game and get something which is not going to be easy mm. we're going to be we're going, if we lose tonight I think we're gone but that was the last game of the season we needed to win had to mm. we had to I win last game of the sure season Goodison Park yeah. Park End they weren't even a Park End there there was fans in the trees wasn't there fans in the trees in, the in, stand stand being built. in Stanley Park because the ground uh, it was all rubble and uh, there were kids swaying about in the trees and we went 2-0 down after 20 minutes but we got a lifeline just before half time got a penalty Graeme Stewart stepped up and put us 2-1 so that was a precious penalty oh massive well probably helped there was no fans behind the goal plus it didn't matter if there were any fans to get you back in that game yeah I didn't see anybody else any of us stepping up to take that penalty <laughs> would you not take whoa <laughs> I were in the Gladys Street end when the, when the referee went like that yeah. I was like oh, I'm not taking this but Graham Stewart fair play to him plenty of balls he went give it me stuck it in so we got a lifeline just before half time the crowd were then up for it and then we gradually got back into the game and Barry Owen scored this unbelievable yeah, goal. Cornelius, he's from 30 yards and he's gone... It's on YouTube. So. Oh, yeah. it's gone top stanch. And he's never hit a ball like that in his life, yeah. Barry. He was known for his tattling and he, he could handle a, a tattle and get about people, but he, he weren't renowned for his long-distance shooting and he screamed one into the top corner. Good reasons to talk about oh. I think. But we still need one more or we're down. Yeah. And uh, Graham Stewart's trickled come up in. with it. it he did trick. <laughs> it's one of the hardest shots. I always say, me after dinner, it's one of the hardest shots I've ever seen at Goodison <laughs> Park. It's right in front of the Gladys Street, and he smashed it. It's bobbled about fourteen times. How <laughs> 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 and Sagers had yeah. dived over oh, the ball, yeah. and nobody cared. Nobody yeah, really cared. He just. Was it. It was unbelievable, and I remember the whistle going, and it was like Crystal Palace. They've all run onto the pitch. We've all run down, and the players' lounge then were right next to the players' dressing room, and all your mates and your family were only the ones that could get in the players' lounge. You got two tickets yeah. every game, so, and I just got dragged in my full kit, my boots, my shorts, Straight dragged in by one of my pals. God bless him. He's he's, he's died now. Ronnie Galvin, never forget him. Dragged me in there. And I stayed in there till six o'clock. Never even went in the dressing room. And I'd had five in bottles, kit. yeah, five <laughs> bottles of Budweiser in my kit, my boots, my pads, and I'm like that. I didn't care what was going on. Yeah, We'd stayed up, and by the time I got in dressing rooms, all the lads were they weren't even dressed; they're just singing and dancing. But you're thinking we're singing and dancing. All we've done is stayed up. <laughs> but it meant so much to this place. Like it Same to so many Palestine. people as well. Yeah, it yeah. does. Mm. It's the life. Mm. It's the life when they watch Everton Football Club. Oh, it's, 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 it was incredible. Isn't there a thing about this pink bit? Yeah, the, the fold is all important, isn't it? Uh, doesn't the table appear uh, under uh, either above or below the fold or something? Yeah, we used to look more so than the table back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where are we? Yeah. Anyway, used yeah, to deliver it. Still too low, Dan. Yeah. Going back to characters, mm. uh, we, we've done a few of these podcasts now. I always end up talking about Kieran Fallon. Mm. He was a character. Now let me let me say he was a he was a character, and and I think we're missing characters like that. I mean, I remember him. I'll tell you a story. I hope he doesn't mind. But one of my mates got a lift with him. He asked for a lift home to Newmarket from Windsor on a Monday night, and the next day was Royal Ascot. First day Royal Ascot. So he asked for a lift home. Said, yeah, no problem. Get in the car. He go down the M4. Supposed to turn left M25 to Newmarket, straight on into London. He said, I've just got to go and see a pal. One thing that you should know that they're in a party in London till God knows what time, and then they have to stay in a hotel. And they wake up in a hotel, Royal Ascot, in a couple of hours. No suit, nothing. But to go and buy a suit that didn't fit. And, <laughs> and he's like, and he makes like he's still riding now, so I won't mention him. But he's like, I can't believe we've done And straight to Royal Ascot, and Kieran walks into Ascot, 
and there's a trainer stood there, he walked in, he's got this suit on, doesn't fit him very well, he's just bought it. <laughs> no tie, and he says to him, oh, Mr. Fallon, no tie today. And he went, looked at him, he says, at least I've got an, a reason to be here. <laughs> and he was like, oh. and he went, he rode three winners, he rode about eight winners, that, but what a character he was. So yeah. I want to ask you about Neville Southall, Big Nev. <sighs> Big Nev was just a one-off. He was unique. People have said to me, Who's the best player you've played with? And for me, it's easy enough to say an outfield player like Kevin Sheedy, Graham Sharp, Terry Ratcliffe. But they weren't. It was Neville Southall. And like, I shouldn't say that as an outfield player, but all them boys that I mentioned, your Peter Reeds, international class, great players, international class, he was world class. Yeah. He, at the time I arrived, and apparently the three years previous, to me getting there, he was un he was unplayable. He was the best keeper in the world. So I think Neville Southall, for me, best keeper I've ever, ever seen play. And that's, I played against Schmeichels, but I played against Grobblers, etc. Neville was, he was that good in training. And you've got Kevin Sheedy who got a wand of a left foot. Yeah. We'd have shooting practice and never get bored. <laughs> and he'd, he'd ask to have his hands tied behind his back. Seriously? Really? Absolutely. It's one of your jokes. No, right? I'm telling you. He ties he get his uh, he get the coach to tie his arm behind, and he'd dive and dive in headers and chest them away and Mate, that's that? how good he were. Mm. And you're like and even Sheed's got a bit annoyed at times. He'd go, Come on now, Nev. Undo your hands. Yeah. Use your hands kind of thing. I mean he was probably I don't know, was he underrated by the rest of the world? We knew how good he was as ever fans. Let me ask you this, when do you remember when he came out and uh he went in I, half time and I was still there. Down. I was still there. We were playing Leeds United. I'd, I'd had a bad hamstring injury. I'd, I'd just got into the England uh, setup for Italian 90. Right. And uh, I had a bad injury against Chef Wednesday. I, it was an hamstring injury, but I knew it were more than that because we had an hamstring injury. You can walk off the pitch. I couldn't even get off, up, and to walk off. And I remember the stretcher coming off, uh, coming over. And it's at home at Goodison, and I thought to myself, I ain't getting on that stretcher because if I'm fit in two or three weeks, my teammates are going to hammer me. You got stretched off, and you're fit in two or three weeks. So I thought, I'm not getting. So I remember I've got the picture in my scrapbook. I've got the U team manager, a chap called Graham Smith, and Chris Goodson, the physio, carrying me round the pitch because I wouldn't get on this stretcher. I was out eventually for two years. Uh, I had a broken bone. Two years? Yeah. I had an hamstring injury that I'd broken a bone in the hamstring attachment. I'd had four operations, and it took me really roughly two years to get back. But I remember getting treatment on my on my scar, needed packing and everything, the day of this game, Leeds. So I've gone in at half time, and we're losing to Leeds United. I think we might have been three down or something like that. And Nev come in, he didn't even go in the dressing room. Yeah. And he sat there, and I've got my head down on getting my treatment, and Nev went, "We well, shit's not done." And I went, come on, Nev, if, come on, don't you be thinking like that. And he went, we are. I'm going out, I'm going to sit on the pitch. Mm. And I went, what? I remember that. Seriously, yeah, yeah. he went, I went. Didn't remember the background. Too. What? Yeah, I didn't. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going out, I'm going to sit on the pitch. And I went, shut up, Nev, and get in that dressing room. <laughs> Next thing, he sat a, in the goal, didn't he? Here's a little cheer, mm. and he's gone and sat by the post, yeah. sat down, yeah. arms folded, and he, he went and did it. But that's the kind of man, he, he was just a bomb winner. He just wanted to just, win, he yeah. just wanted to win for that. Because I remember there was someone around, it wasn't David, he put in a transfer request. Was that true or no? I don't know, I, I, I don't know, but for Neville to put in a transfer request in, it must have been something that he weren't happy with. He, he weren't, that's how, how he, he weren't happy at the best of times no, with Neville. But that's how much it? passion he had for the, for, and he didn't think, I do that when, when Claire won't let me go to the pub. I'll just sit down. <laughs> sit down on the day. What, in, in <laughs> Joseph's so goal for him? <laughs> yeah, in the goal, in the goal, in the goal. He was, he was incredible. He, yeah. he was a, I'll tell you what, guys, we're getting... That's great, but oh, we've, 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 we've finished. We've been beaten like by that. I've got loads up. more. Well, yeah, I want to keep it. Well, well, you'll have to come again. Part two. You'll have to come part, again. Yeah, it's going to be important. Anything left on there that you want to oh, say? No, no, he's fine. It's no, fine. No. no. Leave that for another one. Anyway. Loved it. Loved. I've loved it. I love talking about horse racing. It's my. It's my. I love cricket, horse racing, and football, obviously, and. 
Well, they're two sports clubs. I'm so and great. Football and, yeah, and, and absolutely. Racing. It's great pleasure yeah. for me to be here with you two. And, uh, oh, well, it's been a pleasure for us to uh, see you. Pleasure for me to be in Liverpool because it doesn't happen very often. You're here a bit more often, obviously. Yeah, I'm, I've, I'm home. This yeah. is me. You know, uh, I'm seeing, I stayed with my Uncle John on County Road tonight. We'll have a couple of shandies. And final thought before we go. That was a two-year injury that Snods was talking about. Well, Give us a quick update on, on well, yourself. Well, we're throwing the kitchen very sink Very quick update. It. Yeah. Throw the kitchen sink at it. I'm that red, back in that red year. PT that's um, been putting you through your paces, is he still doing that? He's leaving. He's le- So I've got the, the strengthening and conditioning coach at Oxy House where I go. He's, he's, a, he's a copite. Right, OK. He used to work for... <laughs> he'd call him a dirty the, copite, but yeah, he's got to see him again. Probably. <laughs> he's leaving, he's going to Reading Football Club. All oh, right. right. Yeah, which I'm gutted about. He's pushing... You know them that yeah. pushes me? Yeah. So I probably need, but... It's hard work. Yeah, it? it is hard work. But Mentally, is it going, yeah, I mean, you've been through it for two years. Has it go, is it going okay? It's going. It's on course. It's just going to take a long time, and then we'll look at it after Christmas. Hopefully, we're back in the new year. Well, hopefully, we'll be back before too long as well. Thank you for uh, listening to the Off Track podcast with me, Cornelius Lightfoot, Martin Dwyer, and Ian Snow. And we'll see you again soon. You've been listening to Off Track with Martin Dwyer and Cornelius Lightfoot.